Investors did not like that gross margin outlook for the second quarter, even though it's still double digits. Why, why the disappointment? What's behind the shrink in gross margin? Well, I'm not sure that it's a disappointment. It's certainly not a disappointment to us. Our strategy has been clear. There's a housing shortage in the country right now. Uh, it is well documented. Our view of our mission is to continue to produce homes, continue to build homes. As interest rates has fluctuated up and down, the American consumer has found itself up against the wall of affordability. Mm -hmm. And that means that people are having a tougher time qualifying for a mortgage as uh, monthly uh, payments go up because of interest rates. Uh, they're having a more difficult time because of inflation, uh, saving the amount of money they need for a down payment. Uh, and that just means that our margins are going to get compressed mm -hmm. as we move forward uh, if we're going to meet the market where it actually is. Our view is America needs housing. Sure. And so we're going to continue producing homes and we're going to sell where the market is. Now, from on the, on the brighter side of all of that, we continue to be intensely uh, profitable and generating a tremendous amount of cash and capital. You look at the balance sheet, the balance sheet is really strong and getting stronger. And so as we go through these, this next cycle of, where, of, of interest rates, figuring out where they're actually going to go, mm -hmm. you're going to see our margins move up and down, and that's okay. So, Stuart, I, I hear you that it wasn't disappointing for you guys, but the investors just didn't like it. You just have to look at the stock move. So I'm wondering why you think that uh, it's volume versus margin protection is the right strategy right now in the environment that you just laid out. Well, again, as I look ahead, you look over the next years, we have a housing shortage in the country. Volume is going to be what makes up that housing shortage. We need a healthier housing market for the country. Mm -hmm. And it's really the working class participants that are having the most difficult, uh, the most difficulty finding attainable housing. And it's our mission to continue to produce at the price where affordability meets need. So that's what we're doing. That makes sense. Um, your outlook for this quarter, according to analysts, suggests that you may be easing off of incentives. Do you worry that home buyers have grown too reliant on incentives like mortgage buy downs um, in the way that shoppers won't go into a store and buy anything unless it's 20, 30, 40% off? 80%. 80% for Alex. <laughs> so I don't think it's philosophical. I think it's practical. I think it comes down to how much home can somebody afford. And it really comes down to that monthly payment. And the monthly payment is a derivative of uh, the interest rate. So um, I, I, I don't think that they've become accustomed to the incentives or the buy downs. I think it's a practical reality that in order to make housing affordable, people have to be able to afford a down payment. They've got to be able to qualify for a mortgage. And that mortgage is going to be defined, that mortgage is going to be defined by the mortgage payment, which is interest rate centric. Okay, so there's mortgage buy downs, there's other financial incentives, but I'm curious as to how you address affordability when it comes to your actual product. Uh, do you have smaller square footage homes given this current environment, uh, fewer amenities inside the homes, maybe lower grade marble kitchen counters, for instance? Yeah, it's all of the above. I mean, when when affordability is in the crosshairs of what uh, what makes the market uh, be able to meet need, um, you have to start looking at everything. You have to start looking at square footage. You have to start looking at inclusions. You have to start value engineering every component of the home, uh, which means you know uh, you know making compromises not in quality but in the way that you actually configure homes. So at the end of the day, we have been doing that over the past couple of years to meet the market where it needs to be met in order to make uh, for people to be able to have shelter. Stuart, this would be a really silly question, but what is the exact correlation to mortgage rates when they're six something versus seven something versus eight? Like, I'm trying to get a sense of what mortgage rate on the 30 year fix do you wind up seeing kind of a flood of demand? Well, uh, let's let's go to the outer boundary. Uh, as we started to get to seven and a half and towards eight percent, we really felt the market, fl uh, you know, flutter a little bit and get really swirly. As we start moving back down to seven, six and three quarters, six and a half, 
Uh, it's kind of like we've reached somewhat of a new normal. Uh, the market starts to get a little bit more activated as you get down to six and a half. When you ask the question about flood of demand, I think you're going to have to get down to five and a half and five. And that's where you really start to activate the existing home market to start contributing and, and start bringing product online as well. So one thing that has helped you and other home builders is the lack of competitive supply, certainly in the resale market. But we're starting to see that shift a little bit, especially in markets like Florida. And I'm curious how this affects demand for your product in those kinds of markets. So always remember that when the resale market brings product online, the person that is selling also is a buyer. So it's almost, in my mind, a net zero. Uh, the seller is looking for another home, generally a move up home uh, or a move down home. And therefore, it's really only the new home market that is adding inventory, real inventory to the equation. Um, when you talk about your asset light model, though, uh, as Scarlett was pointing out that you announced you're going to look into spin off your own land into a new vehicle. I mean, I get the idea, but I'm curious as to the timing. Like, why does right now make sense? So this is, a con this is a continuation of a program that we've had in place now for the past five years. And basically, uh, we've been moving land into off-balance sheet vehicles uh, that are basically option-driven, where we're buying, uh, we're buying land just like we're buying refrigerators or buying lumber on a just-in-time basis. This is more of a manufacturing model. Uh, the spinoff that we're looking at today is uh, is, is just like some of the structures that we're already using to, uh, to provide that just-in-time delivery system. This will be, um, as we have it stood up right now, a permanent capital vehicle, which enables us to have more certainty as to where capital will come from and how available it is as the market moves upward and downward. That makes a lot of sense. I'm curious because I know in recent years, um, Lennar has floated an idea to spin off the multifamily operations. Is that still a possibility? Not likely. Uh, we, we walked past that idea as capital markets really changed for commercial properties, including um, apartment. Uh, that change in market condition really put that on, kind of put it in cold storage. And I don't see that market coming back in the near future. So it's a very different concept this time around. Mm. Uh, the spinoff of the commercial side of our business is something that we've stopped. This is purely focused on land and uh, particularly land that will be optioned back to the company.